Yes, so it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the first dialogue on development research of this year. These dialogues are organized jointly by the Development and Aid Policy Team at the Stockholm Environment Institute and Svideb. My name is uh, Fred Sordebo and uh, I'm the chair of Svideb. And before introducing the speakers, I will uh, say a few words about Svideb. Svideb, uh, that is the uh, Swedish Development Research Network, was formed in uh, 2019 and we aim to strengthen collaboration between researchers on the one hand and between um, uh, researchers and policymakers on the other hand. This development dialogue series is one of our activities but we also organize a range of other uh, seminars, workshops and conferences. So please have a look at our website for more information about all these uh, activities. Um, Swedev is an open and inclusive network. Uh, and to become an individual member, you can sign up on our uh, online registry on the website. We also invite research centers and university departments to become institutional members. These institutional members govern the network and design our work program. So please have a look at uh, the website again for more information on how to become an institutional members, uh, member. And with these words, I uh, turn my attention to the two key persons of this event. I'm happy to uh, uh, present and uh, uh, I present Nilimia, Nilimia Gulrayani. She is a leading uh, authority on development policy and development finance and the uh, development uh, uh, architecture. She has published very extensively, both in leading peer reviewed journals and through more policy oriented channels and agencies. So anyone following um, the development debate and development po policy would probably have read or uh, at least come across something written by Neil Lima. She has a long and impressive track record. She is currently a senior research fellow at ODI and visiting fellow at both, uh, both King's College and University of Toronto. She has previously had uh, positions at the London School of Economics and within the World Bank, the Canadian Ministry of Finance, as well as the Canadian International Development Research Centre. So in this seminar, Nilima will present her recent uh, report uh, entitled Development Narratives in a Post-Aid Era. Reflections on Implications for uh, the Global Effectiveness Agenda. This is an uh, exciting study of three dominant and partly competing development narratives, uh, each which offer competing framings of what global, deve global development currently stands for, and each narrative contains different duty bearers and rights holders, if I use uh, Nilima's own terminology. I'm also happy to present Penny Davis as a discussant. She works uh, currently at CEDA as a senior policy specialist and coordinator of the Swedish co-chair in the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation. Penny has um, 25 years experience working on uh, development issues and environmental issue issues within a range of research institutes international organizations and civil society. She has, for instance, previously worked at Swedish uh, Diakonia uh, with development finance and tax justice. She has also worked as uh, independent consultant for the OECD DAC, the UNDP and other development agencies. She has, among other things, also written some of the official papers preparing for the various summits on aid and development uh, effectiveness, such as the one in Accra 
2008, Busan, Busan 2011, and in Mexico 2014. Before I hand over to Penny, I can briefly manage, uh, mention how the event is structured. We should end by quarter past four and a rough time plan is as follows. Nilima will uh, speak for something uh, roughly uh, 30 minutes and then uh, Penny will reflect on the presentation and ask questions for around 15 minutes which means that we have uh, around 15 minutes or so left for uh, Q&A. So with these words, I um, hand over to Penny, please. Thank you very much. And thank you for introducing today's uh, webinar. I think I will, without further ado, hand over to you, Nilima, because we're all very eager to hear the presentation. Uh, so please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Penny, and thank you, Frederick, for the kind words uh, of introduction. Um, can everyone see uh, my first slide on screen? Yes? Okay, brilliant. Um, well, um, thank you to the organizers of the seminar series um, for really giving me this platform and this opportunity to present um, a recent paper um, that's essentially a landscape piece uh, on the ideas that are currently shaping um, global development policy. And um, the piece was published by UNU Wider, and I believe a link will be posted um, in the chat to the piece if you're interested in digging further. Um, but to start, my entry point for the piece was really an observation of the way policy practitioners, politicians, applied policy researchers make sense of this current historical moment in global development. Um, and the piece is really trying to grapple with these ideas and trying to tease out what it might mean for development effectiveness moving forward. Briefly, this moment um, I characterize as one um, of dissatisfaction with ODA and foreign aid and the North-South model of a donor recipient that underpins it. Um, a certain amount of dissatisfaction about multi-stakeholderism while still prized within agendas um, is increasingly also seen as a, as a difficult way to get consensus. Um, geopolitics having returned to the forefront of global development and, and increasingly awareness of the non-negligible cross-border externalities, um, both COVID and a warming planet. So just before I start, I want to make a caveat on the terminology I'll be using here. So I keep with the language of donors and providers, um, and I feel that that works better than the, the the global language of international development partners, where I can no longer make a distinction um, of who is providing um, assistance and who is receiving it. Nevertheless, I understand some of the, um, the difficulties with that language. Um, and I still use the terms North and South, as I think these terms reflect a collective sense of identity um, that can straddle high low income distinctions. For example, if we think about China's use of, of itself as a country of the South. Um, I am fully aware, however, the terms are not geographically accurate. So um, with those caveats in mind, I'll start. Um, feel free to, to tweet um, this presentation. The working paper is, is out, so I'm quite happy to, to have a comment uh, on social media and elsewhere. So to start, I wanted to um, begin with this quotation. Um, which was said by the OECD Secretary General um, after uh, the Busan summit. Um, it was quoted in a paper by um, Rosalind Iben and Laura Savage um, in 2011. And it says, the true achievement of the Busan high level forum is the shift from talking about aid to talking about development. And I guess um, I was intrigued by this quotation because I think if there's one key message that is, is forms the backbone of this paper, is that the shift from aid to development has not necessarily been a source of triumph for development effectiveness, but a source of confusion. Um, and I think this confusion stems from the multiple development narratives that are currently circulating. And um, the paper really suggests we need to grapple with this multiplicity if we want a more robust focus on the how um, development effectiveness will be achieved. Um, 
So in terms of the outline for this paper, I'm going to start with um, a discussion of why, um, how I understand development effectiveness to have underperformed and, and really trying to under to explain why that might have happened. Um, so this is primarily a literature view of, of an extensive amount of commentary and research around um, Paris, um, Busan, and the GPDC um, post-Busan. Um, the second part of the presentation will dig into these, these idea of these narratives and what they are um, in, a, in what I'm calling a post-aid world. Um, and I think this, in terms of just a brief mention of the methods I use, I draw a lot on um, literatures and development ge geography, uh, where arguments about the interconnections of late 20th and early 21st century globalization and capitalism um, suggest a blurring of a north-south distinction. Um, this literature has observed development as a really global intervention, both in scale, where we are now have a supra-territorial endeavor um, that downplays national local dynamics, and really an agenda that is uh, also very wide in scope, um, where sustainable development challenges ultimately unite all countries. Um, and within this discussion of the narratives, um, to tie it back to the development effectiveness um, policy discussion, I really want to zone in in terms of what each of these narratives um, articulate as the duty bearers of effectiveness. So those um, individual states who have obligations to deliver on effectiveness aims and principles and the rights holders of effectiveness, those who are entitled to hold those duty bearers to account. So implicitly in the paper, I'm, I'm honing in on the accountability principle within development effectiveness, I'm looking at how that principle might need to be structured to deliver on the objectives within each of these three narratives. Um, and then lastly, um, and this is the bit which, you know, I'd love a discussion about, um, you know, within with the fact that there are these multiple development narratives circulating today, um, can the pluralism, um, this pluralism be accommodated within the, within the universal logic of development effectiveness? So I want to try and look at this um, from two vantage points. First, for, for global effectiveness policy. Um, and um, Penny um, is very well placed to, to comment on, on that. Um, and then um, really current changes in Swedish political commitment. So Sweden is a steward of effectiveness. Um, so what, these, what this might mean uh, for this stage of effectiveness will be my, my concluding uh, slide. Um, so the first, uh, here we go. Why has development under effectiveness underperformed? So really, um, I offer two explanations in the paper. And the first um, explanation is really the desire for universal applicability. So there was very much a desire for universalism, that these effectiveness principles should apply to all parties and all providers in the North and South. Um, but this had to be negotiated and accepted. And that was a critical aim at Busan. Um, and I think the literature um, has a consensus around the fact that that it wasn't accepted um, and really it has not been since. Um, and the question of why that is, um, you know, there, there are multiple reasons. Um, the, the lack of equivalency between South-South cooperation and, and ODA, which was seen um, largely as a, as a Northern um, donor obligation as opposed to South-South cooperation. Um, Nevertheless, the North went into Busan thinking they could socialize the South into Northern effectiveness norms and practices. Um, but what I think the literature suggests is that the reverse happened um, as, as DAC donors downgraded um, their own commitments, creating a, a new looser, more flexible international regime for effectiveness. Um, and perhaps the, the, the best example of this was um, the opt-out clauses for emerging providers that reduced incentives for compliance. <clears throat> And um, although a, a compromise at Busan was stipulated that Southern providers could define at a later date their differential commitments to effectiveness, um, and that would not be subject uh, to monitoring, um, the reporting right after Busan, there was some monitoring, and in the end, um, the consensus broke down. Um, so I think you know responsibility for this reverse socialization lies you know, in, two, in two camps. First with donors who abandoned the ambitions to coax higher performance from the South. 
um, instead seeking to reap the privileges of minimal monitoring and mutual prosperity as enjoyed by Southern providers. And to the South clinging to the identity as recipients, notwithstanding ever increasing capacity, wealth and influence. Um, and so in a way, um, Amrita Nerlikar in her book talks about how powerlessness of the South or identity as a poor country can actually be a political weapon in international negotiations. And I think the Busan negotiation provides a good example of that. A second reason why um, I think um, development effectiveness underperformed was uh, multi-stakeholderism. And um, here, multi-stakeholderism is defined as a form of inclusiveness, um, various different parties coming together to achieve common goals. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make policy either better or more efficient, though it can enhance legitimacy of world order. Um, and um, Jack Taggart, I believe, has published a lot um, on this idea, and I, I cite him extensively here. Um, the invitation of the private sector and civil society at Busan meant it was quite challenging to obtain a common agreement um, on the meaning of development upon which those effectiveness principles were to be built. Um, for example, the Southern view of neoliberal capitalist growth clashed with civil society's visions of social justice. Um, and essentially, this, this dissociated effectiveness from really what was had been a bounded territory of the MDGs into an almost limitless um, fuzziness of, of sustainable development uh, that was obviously compatible with the 17 SDGs, but nevertheless was very hard to pin down um, in practice. So for these two reasons, um, I think one can also understand um, the kind of the Busan summit um, as having done three things. And, and the first was, I think it, it formally destabilized the aid template where Northern donors had obligations to deliver capital growth and so social benefits to Southern governments. So it really upended the spatial geography of whom aids whom, where expertise resides and where poverty is located. Um, and, and many might say that was long overdue, and I, I, would, I would tend to agree with that. Um, but essentially, Busan marked the end of the idea that poor countries could use aid to follow the modernization and carbon intensive pathways um, of industrial na industrialized nations to catch up. Um, but it also arguably incentivized a race to the bottom with less clarity on who the duty bearers of effectiveness should be. Um, and the arrival of new stakeholders has widened agendas without clarifying who has the rights to hold those duty bearers to account. Um, so essentially this context where the binary of donor recipient um, is delegit delegitimized, challenges are framed as, as global and universal, and the territory of acceptance has expanded, has tethered itself to a very expansive understanding of development, I argue is the reason why um, there has been a search for new development narrative, that the old development narrative has been discredited and that um, the search is on for something new. Um, just briefly, when I talk about a narrative, I'm talking about the norms and identities, um, the product of norms and identities, sorry, but they operate at the level of stories where facts can be shaped, acquire meaning and relevance. So they're heuristic devices that frame how causal relationships can be understood in development, um, which is then the basis for taking certain kinds of policy choices forward so they can define the objectives and the modalities and the outcomes. And multiple narratives can coexist and conflict and policy can and draw on multiple ones, um, even if the ideas can, the policy ideas can be strongly associated to a particular formulation. Um, at any point in time, a narrative can be more or less legit legitimate, but the real proof is how it, um, how it changes negotiations um, and behaviors. Um, and narratives and frames are in a way easier to operationalize than changes in culture, identity, and norms, which are more macro level. So with that, I want to turn with to some presentation of the way I understand the principal development narratives in, in a post-aid world. So um, the multiple, these multiple global narratives that exist, um, they, co they coexist and they vie for dominance. And I'm, I'm very much looking at this from the perspective of Northern donors. Um, so these narratives are the narratives I see amongst DAC members. Um, to uncover these narratives, as I said, it was partly a, a review of development geography literatures, but it was also a review of policy commentary 
suggesting a certain amount of overlap between development, global challenges, and global public goods, and really trying to tease out the differences between these policy uh, literatures, um, but also an analysis of the evolving um, northern donor strategies um, in the context of what I would argue is an increasing desire to instrumentalize development for, for domestic um, and diplomatic purposes. So I identify three, and I argue that all three are responding to this discredited ODA regime and paving the way for a new kind of relation between North and South. Um, as mentioned, the narratives define specific objectives, policy modalities, financing channels, and stakeholders of development effectiveness, and policy can draw on, on several simultaneously. So the first narrative I talk about is a supranational narrative. And really, this is not a new way to frame the purpose of development. Um, but, um, but nevertheless, the, the visible border transgressing nature of, of COVID and, and the climate and climate change have really given it renewed momentum. Um, I talk about this narrative as being addressed largely to the global challenge of, of global public good provision, as well as um, the removal of global public bads. Um, and the policy modality really um, lays emphasis on multilateralism and, and reinvigorates the case uh, for, for multilateral institutions as mechanisms of burden sharing and global collective action. But the truth is that there is no formal system of governance to robustly oversee this GPG investment and accountability. Um, so international institutions can monitor, but they can't actually themselves reduce emissions or climate financing gaps. However, calls perhaps for the MDBs to engage more on global public age might be changing this. Um, in terms of financing channels, there's a strong um, emphasis on ODA, but also on beyond ODA flows. Um, and um, it is also, I should say, somewhat controversial um, that ODA is being used to finance global public good provision. Some argue this is like robbing Peter to pay Paul um, because global public goods also benefit um, the global north, the definition of ODA has to be focused on the welfare of developing countries. So there's some sense in which there's a, tr a trade-off um, uh, in using ODA for a GPG investment. In terms of the duty bear bearers within this paradigm, um, all na nation states are ultimately responsible for the provision of global public goods, but there is a sense that some bear more responsibility than others for their provision. Um, so there's a commitment to this idea of fair share, common but differentiated responsibilities. Uh, but there's also confusion on how to allocate that responsibility. If you think about the, the negotiations that are going to start around loss and damage and how we allocate um, financing, responsibility for financing uh, for that fund. Um, country platforms um, are increasingly be, being viewed as, as a potential accountability mechanism for those duty bearers. Um, these are government-led multi-stakeholder partnerships to connect global efforts to more and better global public good finance. Um, one expects that they will incur responsibility for delivering on the deal struck. Um, so um, the Just um, Transition Partnership in South Africa was an example of these country, country platforms um, negotiated at COP26 um, to really channel um, G7 money, $8.5 billion uh, in support for decarbonizing um, South Africa's debt-laden state power uh, uh, enterprise, uh, ESCOM. Um, and there are mixed um, results coming out of there. I don't want to go into too much detail there, but it is an example of, of a mechanism really to try and hold um, duty bearers to account. The right holders in this paradigm are, are, are citizens in both the North and South. Um, they ultimately are um, the ones who can benefit from global public good production. Um, nevertheless, representation and aggregation of the diverse citizen interests occur through global institutions um, to the extent that they have some ability to police inputs, externalities, and consequences. Perhaps most notable, though, is that some suggest that, that partner countries have fewer rights compared to donors if global public goods are financed through uh, official development assistance or ODA. Um, and the question of whether um, GPGs will incur short-run costs to developing countries, to partner countries, um, even if there are long-run benefits, um, is playing out um, on the climate file um, at this very minute. So the second narrative I wanted to talk about was the nationalist narrative. Um, and this narrative is um, really informed by a focus on global, a global challenge revolving, 
on ge around geopolitics. So really geopolitics is being framed as, as a global challenge akin to climate or, or COVID in this paradigm. Um, and this is particularly the case in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, although even prior the rise of China and its role as a lender of first resort to the South um, had been kind of prompting um, a narrative around, around nationalism and development. Um, and here, um, you know, development is a transactional concept, as a win-win that can accrue to all nations, irrespective of their size or power. Um, it's it's positioned within a, within a strong interest-based conceptualization. And really the policy modality of choice or the exemplar policy modality, as I understand it, would be um, large-scale infrastructure lending schemes, uh, which have been defined as the great game of the 21st century. Um, in the context of the G7, this is often aligned to ideas around uh, green energy or digital transformation. So if you think about the G7's Partnership for Investment Infrastructure or the EU's Global Gateway, these are all meant to represent a competitive offer um, to China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative, linked to a Western framework of sustainability, rights, good governance, transparency. Um, and really represent hard, a harder line uh, towards, towards China in particular. So here, um, the financing channels are, are both public and private finance flows, financial flows, the MDBs, export credits, guarantees. Um, ODA is less mentioned, uh, but public concessional finances, and to the extent that ODA overlaps with that category, you can argue some of it is meant to be leveraging um, private investment. The duty bearers here, I think I largely understand them to be northern governments, the G7, the EU, who bear the responsibility for resolving the geopolitical challenges that now threaten their own national economic competitiveness and security interest. Um, and there's a certain amount of commentary on how hard that might actually, how hard that might be to deliver, um, given China's infrastructure offer is both willing to accept higher project costs, um, absorb project losses, um, ignore social and environmental safeguards, and, and really unlikely to be copied by um, Western Democratic Alliance. And the rights holders here, I think one can understand the citizen taxpayers in the North who underwrite interest-driven development cooperation for the wider family of Western democracies, um, and really driven by considerations relating to geoeconomic preferences. Um, and it, it doesn't really bode well, I would argue, for development and set effectiveness can potentially incentivize donor moral hazard as they try and seek um, the benefits of um, the strategic national interest benefits, let's say, as opposed to, to development result. Um, the third narrative um, is solidarity. And here, um, the global challenge this narrative is focused on is, is global inequality. Um, and the sense in which aid has been, oh, I would say that the, the in global inequality has reduced at the um, inter-country level, but within the intra-country level still remains a challenge and is a driver of global inequality today. Um, the modality, so an example of the policy modality is um, this idea of global public investment, which is focused on the long-term objective of tackling inequality everywhere in such a way that countries eventually converge to higher living standards. The financing channel is really, um, it remains ODA, but a reframed ODA. Um, so it doesn't use the ODA label. It sees ODA as a, as a creating a false hierarchy of nations, um, uh, supporting a paternalistic charitable framework uh, for development that essentially bullies countries to adopt policies. But really it sees global public investment um, as a permanent commitment to concessional public finance for the common good. The duty bearers for solidarity um, are northern, north and south. Um, so this idea of sustained co-responsibility of those two blocks, where rich and poor work together and gain meaningful voice, oversight, and responsibility. Um, in this vision, all countries would provide statutory contributions based on fair share principles. All countries contribute, all countries receive. There's no donors and recipients in this world. And this universal contribution system could potentially, they argue, raise more funding overall for development and ensure the allocation of resources to areas where they might make most difference. Um, in terms of the rights holders um, in this narrative, uh, frontline recipients in need anywhere um, are the rights holders. Um, so all have a say. And civil society actors in particular play a role in strengthening socially led accountability with involvement in decision making at all levels. So where does this leave development effectiveness? So 
Um, I argue that the presence of these multiple narratives has been a source of confusion for how to take development effectiveness forward. Um, for GPDC or any successor project to work, um, we need some shared and bounded understanding of the objective of the contemporary global development project. And really only within a common understanding can we make sense of what development effectiveness should be, how it will be delivered and who should be accountable for delivering it. Um, and I think we ignore contestation um, at our peril. I think it risks another decade of decline uh, for development effectiveness. So I think we need this awareness of narrative multiplicity um, in order really to build some wider political consensus around development um, effectiveness. So to conclude, I'll just, and this is where I think the discussion would be quite um, quite good to have um, the implications, so the, the policy discussion on, on the next stage of development effectiveness for this analysis. So on the screen, I've put up the four principles of development effectiveness. Um, these remain the same as they were in Busan, ownership results, inclusive partnerships, transparency, and mutual accountability. Um, and just as these principles strive to be applicable across all sectors and all geographies um, within the GBDC process, I argue they should also be applicable across all the development narratives in existence today. Um, and this is because narrative pluralism is likely to exist and be with us for some time. Um, and development effectiveness should be able to and, and will need in a way to display credibility among them if they want Northern buy-in. <laughs> Um, and so we, we need to have um, a sort of a multiple development effectivenesses, I would argue, um, for each of these narratives that exist, until at least we know which of these development narratives might become the dominant one to replace the, the former aid paradigm. Um, and so in terms of implications, I'll talk about them in two in two ways. So the first is I think the paper has some specific implications for, for global policy. Um, and since Busan, there's been a failure to ensure robust accountability of effectiveness of the duty bearers. Um, and I think we, we really need to target accountability uh, within each narrative. So just to give you an example of that, um, in a tw 2018 monitoring round, less than half the countries participating had a quality mutual accountability mechanism in place. Um, that is uh, a policy framework targets assessments that are regular, inclusive, and transparent. Um, and I think what that requires to strengthen accountability um, is much more than just a generalized monitoring on the quality of the policy framework, uh, but really thinking about monitoring that serves as a vehicle for strengthening um, the rights to be exercised, so the, the rights of the rights holders, um, and really the duties to be fulfilled. Um, I also think that um, coverage of Northern donors, monitoring of Northern DAC donors remains a strong technical and political competency of the GPDC. And it goes back to the Paris Declaration and the commitments that donors made to monitor. And I, I fear that that focus on the North has increasingly been lost, as, as I suggested um, in my earlier remarks. Um, so I think coverage of Northern donor efforts um, is, is quite important. Um, and it will really, in the, in the current, um, in the communique or the, the final outcome document of the GPD summit in December, um, I had some concerns uh, because there is no longer a, a biennial reporting cycle. So data will be gathered across a four-year rolling cycle, which sort of makes data incomparable as well if we don't have a, a common timestamp. Um, it also depends on which partners volunteer to be monitored. So unlike um, the Paris monitoring, where there was an obligation for, for the donor side to monitor, um, here it is much more voluntarily basis. So the, the ability to acquire time series data is, is really being diluted. Um, and so um, I, I fear that that um, is another way in which the, the GPDC process um, is losing its um, target, like focus on, on the Northern development um, side of the house. Um, I wanted to conclude with a discussion around what the implications of these narratives might mean for Swedish stewardship of effectiveness. So if we think about these three narratives of solidarity, um, transnationalism and nationalism, um, you know, the, the, the moderate coalition government's chosen development narrative will ultimately inform how it stewards the GPDC. Um, and, you know, Sweden is, is a very important player in this. It is the only DAC member co-chair within it. 
So it's clear that its ideas on how to take development effectiveness will matter, matter more than most. Um, now we know the platform of the moderate coalition government has rejected the idea of Swedish exceptionalism as a platform for its moral power. Um, and that the focus now seems to be on Sweden's relation with the world um, and how that relationship can make it a better place and serve its own interests. And so it does seem to me, if I was thinking about how one would map Sweden on my typology, there's potentially a move from a more pragmatic, a move towards, sorry, a more pragmatic nationalist framing and a move perhaps away from a global public good slash solidaristic framing. Um, and one can potentially see this uh, from the pull away from some of the, the central tenets of Swedish development policy, whether that be the 1% ODA target, um, falling investment for multilateralism, a move away from the feminist foreign policy, um, the combination of development and trade as a, as a portfolio within the new ministerial structure, and the way aid is meant to service migration policy. So I think potentially this typology could first of all just make sense in terms of the domestic politics in Sweden. Um, and um, I think it, it will also inform, in addition to the GPDC, potentially inform a proposed domestic reform agenda that looks to bring in a more nationalist narrative within Swedish development cooperation motivated by trade, migration, and security interests. Um, and so I guess, you know, the question I wanted to leave um, this group with was, you know, what are the plausible strategies for grappling with the nationalist narrative on effectiveness? Because Sweden is not alone here. Um, and I'd love to have questions and thoughts and a discussion around that. Um, you know, the trajectory that Sweden seems to be going down is not dissimilar to, to Britain's trajectory over the last few years, um, to Denmark's, to the Dutch. Um, uh, but in Britain's case and in Sweden's case, I think it's quite interesting because both countries seem to be giving up identities as consistent, reliable and trusted partners of, of, of many southern countries. Um, at a time when, you know, if you argue the geopolitical context is one of trying to win Southern support of these in-between countries that do not want to be aligned either to an American um, or a Chinese pole. So in terms of some ideas here, you know, I, I was thinking about whether there were opportunities for, for Sweden to learn from some of these examples, including the British example, where, um, where a new Labour government um, looks set to try and roll back on some of the, the, the changes that have been made um, and regain some of the lost kind of moral power that it had um, when DFID existed and when um, there was a, a cabinet minister for development. That's not to say we can expect it to come back, but nevertheless, there seems to be some um, parallels here. Um, what are the pragmatic safeguards uh, for effectiveness that can be put in place in Sweden? Um, are there opportunities to track opportunity costs and trade-offs of this political move? Um, can Sweden draw on feminist and climate allies to lean in and help and make those arguments? So just to conclude, I think you know Sweden will be very much an example the world is watching. And um, yeah, I look forward to any any comments you might have um, on the ideas in the paper. Um, the full paper can be downloaded if there are any questions. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much, Nilima, for uh, your rich presentation and the very timely paper, not least, as you say, uh, Sweden has taken on the role as co-chair of the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, the GPDC. In your paper, you provide a very comprehensive overview of the involvement of the development effectiveness agenda from the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness back in, in 2005 to the broadening of the agenda to incorporate more actors, modalities of cooperation, including South-South cooperation providers, the private sector and civil society making it uh, uh, more confusing, uh, as you say, uh, but also perhaps an accurate reflection of, of reality of all the stakeholders engaged in development uh, cooperation. Uh, I do agree with what you describe as the development effectiveness being in a state of gradual decline in terms of a waning political appetite in the past few years. But at the same time, I would argue that development effectiveness is more important than ever. 
uh, given the multiple crises that we're facing and the fact that we're off track on so many of the development targets to ensure that we work effectively together uh, to address these challenges based on a set of agreed principles, not least accountability, which you emphasize in your paper, I would argue is, is key uh, if we are to deliver on the commitments we made uh, globally. And I think uh, on a positive note, this was also the message coming out of the Effective Development Corporation Summit uh, held in, in Geneva in December. So uh, just a few uh, introductory reflections and, and coming to some of the questions, uh, I'm very curious to hear your response to, of course, being a practitioner, I'm interested in the policy implications of the analysis and you touched a bit uh, on that in your presentation. But taking a step back, if you had the privilege to decide on actions ahead, what would you like different stakeholders to do? I mean, what initiatives should they take after having read your paper? For example, what would be the preferred course of action for a provider of uh, development assistance like Sweden? And what would be the preferred uh, steps for a provider of South-South Corporation or a recipient country to use the old aid effectiveness language, according to your wishful thinking, <laughs> please? <laughs> You're on mute, Nilima. Sorry. So, no, so great. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> great, great question, Penny. And um, yeah, the paper was quite had big ideas in it. Um, and I'm glad you've tried to pin me down. Um, I have tried, I did try to, to argue that, you know, maybe focusing on where the aid of or the development effectiveness movement started would be a good place. Um, so not wanting to go back necessary to a paradigm of donors and recipients, but really to recognize that we had an agreement at Paris that was meant to be about donor accountability. Um, and I fear we have lost that over the last decade. So for, 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 for providers like Sweden, I think for me, the answer is obvious, is let's develop a robust eroding cycle um, timed, you know, biannually like we had with very clear indicators so we can get time series data on how these principles are being operationalized. So I think the reporting process has been diluted to a point where it's no longer useful for accountability um, and certainly for researchers who use that data. Um, the, the, the research conference that preceded the summit in December had a very interesting paper by two researchers at UN Wider that actually argued that the linkage between the principles themselves and development outcomes didn't even exist, that there was no mm. strong uh, kind of correlation, no strong correlation between the principles and outcomes, which actually begs the question, maybe we don't even have the right principles. Um, so I think there, there may be also a need. So in terms of providers, I think focusing on the provider side, but also really unpacking these principles that seem to have become very jargon fueled um, and really of uh, I, I think an industry has developed around development effectiveness um, that is worrisome uh, for the integrity of the, the concept of effectiveness and in fact may potentially even undermine support for development. Um, so I think going back to basics, I suppose, would be my starting point on the provider side on those principles. Um, and, you know, I think when we're when we're talking about development effectiveness, we also have to recognize that the definition of ODA itself has been grossly undermined um, with, you know, increasing number of things that are now being counted as development or as ODA in terms of the northern um, definition of it. And I know um, there are discussions or certainly activists and researchers calling for even widening the DAC um, to actually bring in southern partners into those discussions of what ODA actually is. And for me, that would actually be a stronger commitment to development effectiveness than the, than the entire monitoring process as currently formulated. Um, so giving you know, recipient countries, Southern stakeholders, a place at that table to actually even you know, ensure accountability, integrity of the, the ODA definition would be, would be also, I think, welcome. Thank you. A lot of proposals, uh, and of course, not a, a, an easy 
task uh, to to answer all, all the perspectives of how to go ahead. But I think you pinpointed some of the key debates that are going on right now within the development community. In your paper, I particularly like the way you focus on the need to consider the obligations and entitlements of duty bearers and rights holders within each of the three coexisting uh, narratives you describe. I think this is a very illustrative way of unpacking the narratives. And, and you mentioned also in your presentation this nationalist narrative uh, with the ultimate rights holders for effectiveness uh, being the citizen taxpayers in northern uh, countries and this orientation toward northern taxpayers um, not boding very well for development effectiveness, which I think we all can agree to. And clearly accountability is an issue and to whom, and this is something you also stressed in your presentation. And of course, quite often development cooperation relationship uh, have result in an upward accountability as opposed to accountability to the intended beneficiaries. And a key question, of course, uh, to grapple with is how can this be addressed? I mean, you point at the important role of civil society, the role civil society plays for holding decision makers to account and for strengthening social accountability, which, of course, I strongly agree with, given my civil society background. But according to you, I mean, is the soli solidaristic narrative, as you call it, uh, as laid out in this idea of a global public investment proposal, is that the preferred way forward? Uh, if so, I mean, that would be a sort of major restructuring, really, of how development cooperation is carried out. Um, I try in the paper to not um, sort of highlight one narrative as, as better mm. than the other, but to lay out a landscape. I think though, what is true to say is that the solidaristic narrative is more in keeping with the ideals in development geography about where global development is. And mm. this idea that there are um, um, basically shared challenges and different starting points <laughs> of countries um, due to historical political uh, legacies. So for me, the solidaristic narrative probably represents the ideal in terms of what development geography is, is calling for. Um, you know, it's, I think it's too soon to tell practically how that agenda will, will unfold. Um, GPI is one manifestation of that. You know, I could argue you know, decolonization as a movement yep. is also part of that as well. Um, so I do think that right now it is, um, it is a it's, there's a strong call for it amongst activists. Um, it is the the paradigm that perhaps resonates the most with the South, because, like I say, this is very much a northern framing of the way I understand, um, you know, development narratives, the way northern providers understand them. But I think if you were thinking about um, how to, let's say, win the in-between countries of the South over, one cannot ignore that solidaristic paradigm. And I think it is really the way that paradigm is perhaps combined with the others that is going to be critical for, for success, if you will, um, if success is political consensus around development effectiveness and then accountability for that um, in the next stage. So I think it's critical, but I think it's it would be far-fetched to ex assume it is going to be um, the defining paradigm uh, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a realist at some level as well. So I think how that is combined, though, with the other, um, the paradigms that we have today will, will become really, I think, the, the, yeah, it will be, it will be where we see energy and success. Yeah. Mm. And, and I guess, I mean, uh, you, you speak about uh, the South and, and the Global South, uh, which, of course, is also an entity that's in no way homogenous. I mean, th there are competing narratives in, in countries as well, I guess. So, so it's not just the North-South divide. That's also the issue of civil society versus government, etc. Uh, so we have a whole range of, of narratives uh, across the spectrum and within uh, the different stakeholders as well. Um, 
I have a final question. And, and before I go ahead with, with that, I just would like to encourage our listeners to also post questions in the chat box for Nalima. We're keen to hear your suggestions and reflections as well. So please go ahead. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, and, and of course, in terms of the implications for the development effectiveness and the GPDC work ahead, uh, which you um, ended your presentation with and, and, and the conclusion of your paper, you addressed the question, what does this all mean for the trajectory of development effectiveness? And first, of course, you argue that uh, the desire to build a global consensus around development effectiveness requires, as a first step, developing an awareness of these multiple narratives. But also, you write that effectiveness principles would need to accommodate the distinctive objectives and modalities, financing channels, etc., within the narratives. And of course, uh, being where I am at, uh, as the secretariat of the Swedish co-chairmanship of GPDC, in terms of what this means for the work ahead, I mean, you say that the GPDC has taken quite considerable pains to underline that these development effectiveness principles can apply to, to um, all geographic and sectoral settings. Um, but you also state something that I would like you to elaborate a bit on. You state that it must demonstrate its applicability across the multiple narratives. And, and you touch upon this in your previous um, comments on what roles do you see for the GPDC in the work ahead? And, and would you argue that the development effectiveness principles have outplayed their role? Or would you say that they are still valid uh, from your uh, research paper? Less so from the research paper as from, I think, that the previous study I mentioned that had been presented at the mm. research conference. I think, um, you know, there is a reason to question whether these are the right principles for delivering the outcomes that matter. Um, but notwithstanding that, um, if you take the, the, the principles as is prima facie, there is a global consensus around them. And so even if we start there with those principles um, as being important, um, I do think how they tether themselves to each of the narratives at play and particularly the nationalist narrative. So in thinking about this presentation and thinking about where Sweden is politically as well, I was very much forced to kind of grapple with, <laughs> with that mm. particular you know, idea of how do you take these principles and 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 actually make them something real in the context of the dramatic political changes that we're seeing in terms of Swedish development policy. Um, and it, it made me think two things. One is that the framing of the duty bearers of development effectiveness as taxpayers doesn't necessarily have to be te a terrible thing, okay? I think ultimately taxpayers are underwriting this resource flow. Um, and if done in such a way that it is um, not necessarily detrimental to the integrity of the ODA definition um, and is done in such a way that um, Southern participants and, and, and recipients can engage with as well in dialogue, it, it, there is the possibility and potential to actually engage with that framework a little more. It doesn't necessarily have to mean um, a pure return to results-based management in the 2006 version of Swedish seat. I mean, there, there are ways we can think about this. I think there's, there's opportunities for guardrails as well. Um, and what's really disheartening is in a way, the way the DAC seems to have removed some of those guardrails around the ODA definition in particular, but thinking about ways Sweden in particular in dialogue with the South can actually think about the guardrails of terms of what is and is not acceptable um, in the context of a nationalist framing. It doesn't have to be um, a source of, of, of terrible hand wringing. I mean, there, there, there should be a the possibility for creatively linking these principles to that paradigm. Um, but obviously, I'm not in the role that, that you were in, in terms of, um, you know, coming up with the concrete policy recommendations that need to be taken forward, although I'd, I'd happily think about them a little more concretely. I mean, this was a big ideas piece, um, but I don't I don't see it. Um, I don't see the nationalist narrative as 
inherently incompatible with the solidaristic one, um, I guess is what I'm trying to, to underline. I guess, I mean, what we're seeing is a power struggle. I mean, DAC is a member-based organization and, and uh, the discussion of the definition of ODA and what that could encompass is a reflection of, of political priorities of, of members, of course. Uh, but the, the, the principles, uh, country ownership, focus on results, inclusive partnerships, transparency, mutual accountability, uh, our principles sort of derived from decades of experience of knowing what works to deliver better development outcomes. So in a way, you could see that they are also very important to fend off sort of uh, political initiatives to try to dilute uh, what effectiveness is about. I mean, that they are sort of universal principles that we have agreed on. Uh, so from that perspective, I would say that they're quite important in the landscape uh, we're facing uh, in, in um, uh, globally and the discussion that's going on on development effectiveness. Uh, we have a question from the audience, um, uh, speaking out power dynamics. Uh, what implications will a shift towards a multipolar global governance landscape have on development aid and the providers like Sweden is the question. So. I'll let you, Nilima, answer that in whatever way you see fit. I mean, if we argue that we already we are in a multipolar world at the minute, um, I do think that it supports uh, a more interest-driven understanding of what development is, um, and and in that respect, the domestic political context that is. You know, being faced in Sweden is probably the adaptive response to that, that context. Uh, um, you know, it 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 is a it is a a context where states sort of acutely and citizens acutely feel the the radical uncertainty of a poly crisis, um, and states are being asked to to respond uh, accordingly. Um, so I suppose a multipolar landscape probably, in my view, would privilege a more nationalist framing. And yet, um, to actually achieve the peace and stability that that you know we all want, must grapple with that solidaristic paradigm as well, right? So the the paradox is if you just go wholeheartedly down the nationalist path, you are unlikely to achieve <laughs> the. Um, the you know the hegemonic or the kind of multi hegemonic stability that one wants of a, of a bipolar world let's say at least so um, I, I would that would be how I'd characterize I think the, the the landscape at the minute and what that might mean for development effectiveness mm. yeah interesting uh, we have another question from the audience um, let me see oh it's a long one here with the war in Ukraine and the increasing separation of the U.S. and China. Do you foresee a new and simpler world order emerging that, while incredibly dangerous in terms of world peace, might lead to greater clarity on development rights and responsibilities? For example, a first world West and second world China Russia competing for the attendance of the rest of the world, for example, through development and climate funding. Wow, that's a, <laughs> a massive question building on, on the discussion we just had on. on the power dynamics and multipolar uh, world order? Well, I think, I mean, I don't know if I got the full question, but certainly the beginning bit is, you know, this comment that is it resulting in a simpler world order? Um, I and do a think- more dangerous one. And yeah. well, yeah, so <laughs> there may be some tension within that, but I do think this, um, the current context lends itself to, I won't want, I don't want to say, uh, a new Cold War-like framing, but certainly a sense in which it um, it builds blocks in such a way that development rights and response, the countries where there is more ability to secure development rights and responsibilities are likely to be in the sphere of influence of the DAC member states um, in a way they weren't in the past. So I expect to see, um, if you think about aid allocation data, much more emphasis on democratic um, building rights, building and democracy, um, avoiding the democratic backslides that we've seen in in certain countries, 
Um, the question of how that is achieved um, in a context where finance, geopolitical clout of China in particular is so great um, is an interesting one. So I think the West will be picking, cherry picking its, its countries of priority in a way to support a simpler world order where it has a smaller number of states well aligned to, to its own kind of focus on democracy. But I do expect that um, investments in, in democracy and rights to grow actually in the next few years. Hmm. And now we have a question uh, from the audience picking up again on this uh, discussion about narratives. And the question is as follows. Can we remain with a unitary concept of development effectiveness, given that we will likely live with several narratives simultaneously with partly different goals? And I, I think my argument is we we can't uh, that we have yeah. we have these four principles there. They need to apply in different ways to the different different narratives. Um, you know, there are obviously these questions about are these the right principles, but just suspending that for the moment and taking them for what they are, that that those principles need to grapple with these these new ways we think about development, at least until such time as we think we converge on one. But I expect that to be a more medium to long term. A timeline. Mm, yeah, and and I guess I mean I like to th think about the principles of being able to hold the different stakeholders to account. At, at least that's how I think they should be used. That was what we had intended from from the beginning, so to speak, in in this agenda. Okay, now we have a slightly more sort of. Um, detailed practical question here uh, on, on ODA and private sector funding. Does increasing private sector funding leveraged by ODA increase the risks of tide aid? Now, that's a whole chapter in itself. I don't know if you want to have a go uh, to respond to that. I don't think it has to by definition, um, but the, the, the possibility for it doing so, at least informally tied aid, where certain awareness and tenders are made available to domestic economic and commercial enterprises so that they even know that these bids and opportunities ex exist, um, is, has been there for, for a long time. I don't think it necessarily has to. Um, <laughs> But again, I'm not an expert on, on PSI instruments and how that links to, to ODA, um, except to say that I think one is increasingly seeing the, um, the linkage between concessional and non-concessional forms of finance within a nationalist narrative. So if you think about the Global Gateway and you think about um, these large um, uh, G7 projects under the Partnership and Investment of Infrastructure, a whole of government approach to thinking about the multiple arms of finance and how they come together to acquire the capital to invest in these large scale infrastructure projects is definitely a modality within within that narrative, but also in the global public good narrative as well, I suppose, right? Bringing private sector investment in, um, recognizing the climate challenge um, is well beyond the financial capabilities of, of, of ODA. Um, but I, I suppose it could, it doesn't necessarily have to promote side aid, but could potentially. Maybe just to clarify for the audience that one of the old aid effectiveness commitments, uh, which still stands, is for donors to untie their aid as tying aid to the procurement of goods and services from donor countries means on average that um, ODA becomes 30% or so more expensive for the recipient. So it's a very inefficient use of, of aid. Um, uh, and and the untying of aid is, of course, different from uh, leveraging ODA for bringing in the private sector. Uh, but, uh, um, Okay, sorry, we, we have a, a question, and that would be, I think, the final question from the audience. Uh, there seems to be a lot of appetite about this uh, sort of geopolitical discussion, uh, uh, which is, of course, important. It's a long question. I'll, I'll have a go. Is there a risk that an extreme nationalist agenda will make development effectiveness and ultimately all development act as irrelevant? Um, and, and it's a longer explanation if the focus is on trade, migration, security, national benefits, 
uh, for Sweden, most development activities by developing country institutions or local organizations will not impact those objectives in any significant way, then it doesn't matter if money is spent on effective development efforts, only how well the public servant reporting on an effort can connect them to the nationalist agenda. I guess, I mean, the European point a big risk here and there's an appetite to discuss this risk and uh, uh, feel free to, to uh, respond to that uh, in whatever way you can. And you also mentioned this before, so. Yeah, I'm not sure I got the, the whole question, but I... No, I, it was it, basically a bit too long for me to read. But I, I think that there's the risk here that the nationalist agenda uh, will uh, pose a major threat to uh, the development effectiveness and, the, and, and making sort of the development set up irrelevant if you... So I, I think it will encourage a different concept of what development effectiveness is. Mm. I mean, you know, like I said, the, the duty bearers and rights holders are, are different in that um, narrative. So I think, yes, if, if that's um, the question is, will it shift, you know, the foci of development effectiveness and um, and and privilege certain actors and voices over others? Yes, absolutely. Um, but. Like I said, I don't. These are these are ideal type structures. These narratives are ideal types, yeah. and in reality, policy draws on multiple narratives at, at any given time. If you think about, you know, just transition, you have an, an, a nationalist and solidaristic and global public good narrative. I'd argue embedded embedded within within that potentially, or feminist foreign policy as well. So, I think there's scope to privilege multiple duty bearers and and rights holders um, within any given policy space. But the important thing is that I think the development effectiveness movements realizes that these this multiplicity of the ways we think about development um, suggests there are different actors to privilege rather than just thinking about it. In a way, I, I think the, the the takeaway is that we've gone beyond Paris, we recognize in our declarations that we are no longer in a donor recipient world. But what we don't seem to recognize is that even within that provider category, there are multiple ideas of what development is, how it is to be achieved, where expertise lies. And if the global development effectiveness movement wants the North's buy-in, which it has lost, I'd argue, over the last decade, um, it needs to grapple with these uh, this complexity in the world in terms of what development is. Um, so I, I'll leave it there, I think. Yes, thank you. I'm sure you're available to further questions if, if audience would like to post them. Uh, you, you, we have your contact details on the webpage, I think. And just to, to finish off with some final comments on, on the work, as I'm sitting in the Secretariat of the GPDC at CEDA, uh, as mentioned, Sweden has, since the Geneva summit in December, taken on the role of co-chair of the uh, GPDC. Uh, this is the role that we share uh, together with Indonesia, uh, representing uh, so-called dual countries, countries that are both providers and recipients of um, development cooperation, and the so-called non-executive fourth chair represented by civil society. And uh, Sweden... Um, uh, did I mention DRC as well as a partner country? So we're four co-chairs together and, and CEDA has been given the task by the government to take this chairmanship forward. So we have a small secretariat set up uh, for this purpose and uh, the representative of the Swedish co-chair in the GPDC is the CEDA deputy uh, secretary general, Marie Ototon. And uh, what is unique though with, with the DPDC and uh, what is a street key strength is that it is a multi-stakeholder platform. It encompasses all stakeholders engaged in development cooperation. And uh, to be fair, I mean, the GPDC has gone through a reform process based on quite critical thinking on the future of the development effectiveness agenda and the work ahead. And uh, uh, is now embark embarking on a more sort of country focused delivery model. Uh, we're now developing a work plan for the next coming four years. Uh, flagship of the work will be a renew, uh, renewed way of monitoring progress of the development effectiveness commitments. 
So the idea now is not uh, for the, mon the, the monitor will not only track progress, but the idea is that it will lead to inclusive follow up dialogues uh, in countries and on a global level to drive behavioral change to a greater extent uh, than before. And of course, this is no easy task, uh, but it's a very important one uh, as we are off track on so many of the development targets, as mentioned in the beginning. So we hope and believe that the GPDC can help to drive change through the improvement of how we work together uh, in effective uh, partnerships. So this is what we will strive for in the coming uh, four years. And I guess that would be my final words. And I'll hand over to you, Frederick to make the closing remarks. Thanks. Thank you both and to the audience. Uh, to me, this has been a really successful uh, dialogue. Uh, to me personally, it, it has uh, uh, illustrated uh, the diversity and pluralism in uh, thinking about development. Uh, I mean, uh, some years back, uh, there was a discussion that uh, uh, the SDG agenda and uh, uh, the thinking about global development would uh, bring some sort of unity. But here uh, we can see a, a very big diversity. So thank you to Nilima and uh, Penny and to the uh, audience and to the questions. Uh, uh, before closing, I just want to mention two things. Uh, first, keep your uh, eyes on the Swedev website for more information about forthcoming dialogues on development research. The program is not, uh, has not been finalized for the spring yet, but, but uh, there are still some details before we can uh, market the next dialogue. Uh, and there will be uh, forthcoming dialogues, uh, dialogue seminars in, in, in the fall as well. Uh, my second point is that uh, I want to draw your attention to uh, the uh, Nordic Development Research Conference called NUDEV, which will be organized in Uppsala uh, in, uh, on uh, 21 to 23 of August. Uh, the reg registration is now open and the deadline for submission for submission of paper abstracts has been extended until 1st of April. Uh, I encourage you to, to submit uh, abstracts and uh, join us at the conference in August. Uh, so with, with these words I uh, close the me meeting and wish you a good afternoon and uh, later evening. Thank you. Thank you so much.